What's up, YouTube? This is the host. You're watching The Gray Medium, and today we're going to be discussing Aaron Morgenstern's The Starless Sea. This is one of those books I would have never talked about on my channel. I usually don't discuss any fiction on my channel simply because I find it hard to make informative videos about fictional stories, but the more that I read fiction and the more that I read books like The Starless Sea, I've begun to realize that there's a lot to learn from reading fiction. Anyways, I had to read this book for class, and I found it to be super interesting, and it really went along with all the things that I've been pushing on the channel recently. Is I'm not going to sit here and try to explain the plot too much. This, this book is really a lot to unfold, and you're just going to have to read it yourself to understand it the most. But I will say some things that Morgan Stern is good and also bad at. I really just want to start off by pointing out how descriptive Morgan Stern is. It is absolutely overwhelming how much detail she goes into describing certain places and people and things. That being said, this description is so good that it is literally bad. I cannot tell you how many times Morgan Stern describes something as golden like honey or sweet like honey or how she describes things as dimly lit and how she focuses on lighting and scenery and, and all these specific details which are really great but she does it so much so that it becomes too much. <clears throat> While discussing this book in class my professor cracked a joke about how if she were editing this book she would have cut about 75 pages out and I 100% agree there's almost too much description it's it's a little bit overwhelming. That being said Morgan Stern obviously is educated in theater and she's really big on lighting and setting the scene, and she's even admitted that when she writes books, she doesn't start with characters or with narrative. She picks a place, and then she writes a story around a certain place. So, knowing that, I think it's understandable why she puts so much emphasis on detail. And with Starless Sea in particular, I feel like the style is important. She has to be so overly descriptive in order to paint a picture to cover up the fact that she's talking about really common things that most people like you and I are going to experience in our normal lives. While reading The Starless Sea, I found that I kind of had to differentiate between different stories. You have primary stories, which mainly focus on Zachary Ezra Rollins in real life, in real time. That being said, you do also have the secondary stories, which, spoiler alert, you don't really know it till the book starts to unfold in the end, but really are vaguely on the same timeline as Zack's story. They just are happening so far in the past that it's hard to think that they're actually on the same timeline. And then you have your tertiary stories, uh, which are really just metaphors or symbols for concepts that are being echoed throughout the entirety of all the stories put together. So with primary stories, like I said, you're mainly following Zachary Ezra Rollins, uh, in the present day in real life. And then in your secondary stories, you're hearing about the pirate and the girl, the ballad of Simon and Eleanor, uh, the three swords. And then as you move even further down and you start looking at those tertiary stories, as I would describe them, you start to see the inn at the edge of the world, the star merchant, uh, time and fate, the story sculptor, the moon and the stars, the owl king, the key collector, you have all these smaller stories that really serve as symbols and metaphors to help get bigger points across within the secondary and primary stories. So once everything starts to loosely come together in the end, you start to realize what it is that Morgan Stern's really trying to get across to readers. I really felt like Morgan Stern was trying to drive home the idea that so much in life is out of your control. Time and fate will always win. And because there's things that you can't control, you should just go about change and go about growth, embracing it, and not fearing what's to come next. Morgan Stern uses her characters to stress how stories don't necessarily need a happily ever after style ending. You really just need some sort of place to say goodbye and to embrace that one ending is really the creation of another beginning. The key point in this book that I kept finding repeating is the opening of doors. Every time a character opened a door, they stepped out of the world they were comfortable with, stepped out of their comfort zone, into a new world, discovered something new, and embraced the beginning of a new story. I found that the doors were really symbolic of stepping out of the world that you know, and out of your comfort zone, and into a new, unfamiliar space. It's once we embrace weird and we try new things that we actually grow as people and the story continues on. Yeah, you're closing the door on the world behind you, but you don't have to perceive that as an ending. You could just perceive it as opening the world, opening the door to the world in front of you and embracing a new beginning. 
I saw the point that Morgan Stern was trying to make about fate and time was really drove home early and often in this book. As early as page 134, we hear Morgan Stern state, Fate always gets what fate wants. Morgan Stern then mentions fate again on page 211 when she says, Fate and time can kill as many things as they please and will eventually kill them all. I find this important that she continues to drive home this idea that, look, no matter what you do, you can't overcome the nature of nature and the fact that things will be born, live, die, and be born again. And it's once I was reading the book over again, looking for the examples of time and fate, that I acknowledged how she also mentions change so closely related with time and fate. We could go ahead and start looking at change on page 180. During a conversation between Mirabelle and Zachary, on page 180, the text reads, Change is what a story is, after all. This is the first time we hear of change, but it's definitely not the only, as it comes up again on page 271. On 271, Morgan Stern again mentions, Time passes, things change. And then again, on page 291, she says, Places change, people change. And it's only fitting that the story would end with another comment on change. On page 550, the text reads again, This is not where our story ends, he writes. This is only where it changes. And this is where I really want to draw importance upon why it is that Morgan Stern uses so much detail. You'll see that there will be 75 to 100 page sections of fictional stories, but then they almost all feel as if they're capped off by some important dialogue between characters within the primary story, like Zachary, Dorian, Mirabelle, the Keeper, Cat, whoever it may be. And I feel as if these stories, obviously, are warming us up to the bigger ideas that these characters are facing. So it's funny recognizing how there's all these different stories, but they're more or less following these same ideas of time, fate, and change. Even Zachary has a conversation with the Keeper that almost makes us feel as if the Keeper is not only conversing with Zachary, but as if he's breaking the fourth wall a little bit to make a comment towards readers. In this conversation with Zachary, the Keeper states, quote, Each of us has our own path, Mr. Rollins. Symbols are for interpretation, not definition. And then we see that this may not have necessarily been the Keeper speaking, but more so Morgan Stern speaking, as a similar idea is mentioned again on page 518, this time by Cat. Cat says, Epic branching story that doesn't stick to a single genre or one set path and turns into different stories, but it's all the same story. I find both of these comments to be really interesting because this is where I really felt like Morgan Stern was using her characters and using her story to really talk to readers and to really tell readers that they should be opening doors, stepping into the unfamiliar, and to embrace the fact that each person's story requires different actions. But the fact of the matter is, is that if you want your story to keep moving forward, you have to keep taking action. You have to keep moving forward. You have to keep opening doors. Regardless of if it's Katrina in her journal, Mirabelle talking to Zachary, the Keeper talking to Zachary, or any of these other conflicts within characters within this story, the idea of moving forward, creating change, and continuing to try new things is something that I found to be repeated over and over and over again within the Star of the Sea. Okay, I swear I'm beating you to death with these quotes, but I've got two more that are really important to the message that I think Morgan Stern's trying to drive home. On page 537, when we start to see the story unfold, and we start to see the ending come into clear view, we have a really interesting piece here. The text reads, I think the whole story has meaning, but I also think to have a whole story-shaped story, it needs some sort of resolution. Not even a resolution. Some appropriate place to leave it. A goodbye. I think the best stories feel like they're still going. Somewhere. Out in story space. 
I remember wondering if this story was an analogy about people who stay in places or relationships or whatever situations longer than they should because they're afraid of letting go or moving on or the unknown. Or how people hold on to things because they miss what the thing was even if it isn't what even if it isn't what that same thing. And then the last thing we hear from Kat really puts the cherry on top when it comes to this idea across the entirety of this novel. And she states, Sometimes life gets weird. You can try to ignore it, or you can see where weird, where weird takes you. So obviously, I just beat you over the head with a bunch of quotes about accepting things that you can't change and actively choosing to take action and moving life forward. Like I earlier mentioned, this book wouldn't have happened. There wouldn't be a story. There wouldn't be anything worth reading if a character like Zachary didn't take the initiative to open the door in the first place. I really felt like this book found me at the perfect time. Every spring, I really work hard to make content that reflects my feelings of embracing new change and growing with the year. Once spring has sprung, I feel like I have to take initiative to try new things and to push myself out of my comfort zone. So to have found this book while I was writing New Chepi, I found this book really, really interesting and it really fueled a lot of my thought processes moving forward. I feel like Morgan Stern was really using this story to tell people to step out of their comfort zones, to embrace weird, and to open new doors. Which is some advice that I took maybe a little bit too literally. I used this book as motivation to start going to office hours and to start just opening professors' doors. Fact of the matter is, is a lot of the time, they're not even closed, and you don't really have to bother opening them. They're just open to invite visitors anyways. In a book that describes so much stuff, I found a lot of joy in walking into professors' offices and looking at their stuff, and then jokingly starting a little competition around which, which one of my professors has the best-looking office. The point is, is that I took motivation from the book to go step into uncomfortable new worlds, to meet new people, and to see how it is that my professors go about spending their time while they're at school not teaching class. Every time I opened a door and went into a new professor's office, which I did four times while reading this book, I discovered a new office and a new little bit of personality that each person had that I didn't see during their class hours. I found this really rewarding. Obviously I'm not Zach opening doors to magical underground worlds, but I might have got something better. I was opening doors and inviting myself into new people's worlds and learning things about people that I wouldn't have known otherwise. And I found that my experiences were really rich and diverse in just opening doors and stepping into people's worlds and learning more about different people and just diversifying my overall life experience. And because of that, I really like this book. As much as I described the detail being really, really obnoxious in the fact that it made the book a lot longer than it had to be, the overall general idea is really great. Step out of your comfort zone, keep moving forward, and even if you mess up, look back to the gray medium lecture Noom Chepi, start over, and embrace the idea that, hey look, it's not necessarily an ending of one story, it's just the beginning of another. But as I said, this book really just served as a reminder to myself that I needed to go meet people, open doors, engage with my professors, learn more about them, and push myself outside of my comfort zone. And for that, I'm really grateful. This book hit me at the perfect time, especially while I'm in this mindset, and I really did enjoy going into professors' offices and stepping into their worlds. I wasn't stepping into the starless sea, I wasn't embracing a world of magic beneath the uh, Earth's surface, but that's really how it felt a lot of the times when you're going up to a professor's office and trying to open their door and, and have a somewhat meaningful conversation without feeling like you're wasting their time. And for that reason, I really do appreciate this book, and I really do recommend that you read it, even if it's something that doesn't really appeal to you at first. Obviously, I don't really read fiction, I specialize in nonfiction, and I find it difficult to talk about fictional books except for books like The Starless Sea. And I say that because despite all the magic and all the fantasy, you really do get real-world concepts. There's a ton of detail and a ton of plot that they're buried beneath, but if you really read through the book and you're paying attention, you could see the symbols and the metaphors and, and what it is that Morgan Stern's really trying to tell readers. And once you catch on to that, like it had on me, 
it could have a really positive effect on the way you view things. So for that reason, I really like The Star of the Sea, and I think if you read it, you will too. Nonetheless, leave a like and a comment if you enjoyed the video, subscribe if you haven't already. This is The Host, you're watching The Gray Medium, stay gray.